Uh, uh, the Bible, the Bible, the Bible says in Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2, it says, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not be conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the precious Holy Ghost, we pray and we give thanks. God, breathe on us the breath of life. That in that breath, we might find Give us what we need to do on this day, that your name gets the glory and the praise. God, we thank you now uh, in Jesus' name. Uh, and the people of God said, amen. Amen. Oh, I want to I wanna chat with you for a few moments, if I can, uh, from this thought. Uh, you are a living sacrifice. You are. You are. Matter of fact, touch yourself, say, I am a living sacrifice. I am a living sacrifice. Living, living sacrifices. Uh, now, that's an interesting term or phrase, a living sacrifice. A living sacrifice. A living sacrifice is an interesting term. It's an interesting phrase. It sounds to me like an oxymoron, living sacrifice. Sounds like an oxymoron. It doesn't make any sense to me. A living sacrifice makes no sense. The two words are the complete opposite in terms of their definition. Makes no sense. They're both together. It makes no sense to me because the words uh, living, zao, uh, is to be full of vigor, to be fresh, to be strong, efficient, active, blessed. It is to be endless in the kingdom of God. And uh, let's look at the word sacrifice. Same word. Let's look at sacrifice. Look at it in the Greek translation, uh, the sia. Uh, it means uh, uh, to slay. It means to kill. Sacrifice means to kill something. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, and, 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 and so we have these two, these two Greek words packed right next to each other, uh, zao and uh, thusia, uh, uh, living sacrifice, and, 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 and it really makes no sense to me that the both of those two words are together. Look at somebody say, it makes no sense. It makes no sense. When I think of the word sacrifice, certain images come to mind. I think uh, of, a, of a play in baseball. I like baseball. I, I love baseball. One of my favorite sports. I love baseball. But when I think of sacrifice, I think of baseball, you know, where one player is tagged out uh, purposely um, on the part of, of the player, another player, so that his fellow teammate can score a run while activity is redirected away from him. We call that a sacrifice. Look at somebody say sacrifice sacrifice. Yeah. I think of those old black and white horror films uh, uh, where human sacrifices were uh, uh, were made restless natives or evil demonic beings like vampires uh, and witches. I remember sacrifices. I do remember Gilligan's Island. Remember the natives tried to sacrifice those uh, who were on the island. I think of sacrifice. I, I think of current understanding of sacrifice made by individuals involved in dark arts. I think of that. Sacrifice in those terms he really has an image about it. And so Paul also had an image. Paul had an image of sacrifice in his mind. Look at somebody say sacrifice. Paul would have been thinking of the religious practice in his day of offering. Here it is, animal sacrifice that was performed, watch this, for forgiveness and thanksgiving within Jewish worship. 
uh, the Catholic Encyclopedia explains it this way. It says God spoke to Moses, revealing to him in detail the sacred signs and ceremonies by which the Israelites were to manifest more explicitly their faith and their relationship with God. There were ceremonies by which the people were made and signed as worshipers or ministers of God. Thus, we have circumcision and the consecration rites of the priest. There were the ceremonies which consisted in the use of things pertaining to the service of God, like the Paschal Lamb. You heard of the Paschal Lamb, haven't you? The Paschal Lamb at the Passover for all the people. There were the ceremonies of purification. You know about that. It's in the Bible. Uh, ceremonies of purification from the contamination, contamination of, of various things. You know, it's in the Bible. This includes the washing of hands, the washing of feet, the shaving of the head, and the offering of grains, the first fruits, and the offering animal blood and animal meat on the altar of God. Yeah, visual images that would come to Paul's mind would be those involving the shedding of blood. Yeah, in the ninth chapter of Genesis, Noah, you know Noah, he's in the Bible, Noah and his sons, you know, Noah had sons, you know, and they were instructed by God after leaving the ark never to eat the meat of animals that were still contaminated, uh, uh, or rather still contained blood within it because blood is the life source of all living existence. Whew. So the shedding of blood was a serious matter and the animal sacrifice was a very serious and sacred part of Jewish worship. But here in the text, Paul calls us to be Zaothusia. He calls us, Simon Temple, to be living sacrifices. There is a kind of glad it's not you, uh, uh, that it's you and not me element to animal sacrifices. There is a way in which not to take the act of worship personal when it's not your personal blood that's being shed. Hmm. Well, uh, yeah, yeah. And, 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 and so Paul's thinking of the way in which Christ's blood was shed for us invites us to a place ourselves in the place our position of the animal sacrifices. Uh, Paul invites us to take it personal. Mm, yeah, this is good stuff. What does it mean to be Zaothusia? What does it mean, Simon Temple, to be living sacrifices, to live a life of what appears to be a contradiction? Addiction in terms. Well, someone once said, the trouble with living sacrifices are they keep getting down off the altar. Either we forget or choose not to live a life of sacrifice. Uh, one says, did you ever realize you have been offering your body as a living sacrifice all along? It's true. We do it throughout life. Most people are offering the parts of their body in slavery to impurity and wickedness. Now, they aren't necessarily aware of doing that, but indeed, that's what we see all around us. For example, when people relinquish their feet, listen to this, Simon Temple, to go where sin takes them, to wrong places, to harmful and hurtful places, when their tongue, that's just a better way of saying your mouth, look at somebody say your mouth, look at them say your big mouth okay let's keep going when their tongue speaks words that hurt and harm other people 
when their hands do things that are not pleasing in the sight of God, when their eyes and ears see and hear the trash in this world, they have sacrificed these parts of their bodies to evil. Some people sacrifice their bodies to meaningful and trivial things, their hands, their feet, their eyes, their ears, their tongues, their hearts are sacrificed to time-consuming activities that are largely insignificant. But as a child of God, look at somebody, tell them, I'm a believer. Look at them and tell them, I am a child of God. As a child of God, I have the opportunity, watch this, to offer my body as a living sacrifice so that I bring glory. Look at somebody, say glory. So that I bring glory to the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the only reason why I'm an, I'm, I am a sacrifice because I want to bring glory to the name of Jesus. So instead of using my body in acts of evil and insignificance, I can, if I choose, look at somebody and say, I got the choice. Can we be real today? I've got the choice to choose to be a part of God's eternal plan and have God's power working through my body. I've got a choice. I, I've got a choice. That's one of the reasons why I have to give God praise because if I'm not careful and I step out of the way, I might do something messy. Look at somebody say messy messy. Can I just ask a question to the real saints? Can I just ask a question to the folk that know Jesus? Have you ever been in a situation in your life where you neglected to praise God for whatever reason it was and you found yourself in a mess? Have you ever been in a show enough mess but then you had enough sense to give God praise in the middle of your mess and somehow God brought you through. I just need a couple of capable witnesses in this house who can testify. I need a testimony. I need a real testimony. I need somebody to testify that I was in trouble, but I called on the name of Jesus. And when I called on the name of Jesus, he made everything all right. Look at your neighbor say, won't he make it all right? Won't he do it? Ah, look at somebody else say, won't he do it? Won't he, won't he do it? <laughs> yes, he will. Matter of fact, look at him say, won't he do it? But then I want you to answer and say, yes, he will. <laughs> say, won't he do it? Yes, he will. <laughs> he got me out of trouble that I couldn't get myself out of. Anybody ever been there? You ever been in a mess, a show enough mess, and you didn't have the power or the ability to get out by yourself, and you called on Jesus, and he stepped in? and pulled you out of the wreck that you were in, I dare somebody to give the Lord some praise. <laughs> well, 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 Simon Temple, oh man, I want to preach this thing. But what exactly does it mean to be a living sacrifice? I'm glad you asked me the question. Well, all preachers love metaphors. We love metaphors. We do. A metaphor is a word or phrase yeah, used to represent or explain something else. Preachers have their favorites or like we used to say back in the day, your favorites. And, and Paul is no exception. Paul, he understood the power of metaphors. Yes, he did. And so, one of his metaphors that he liked was of the human body. Paul liked to make reference to the human body. Paul uses it in several of his letters, and there are at least four reasons. Look at somebody say four. There are at least four reasons Paul likes and uses this metaphor. Mm. 
<laughs> First of all, Paul uses the metaphor or the human body to discuss salvation. Oh, man, I wish I could park here for just a second and say I thank God for salvation. <laughs> Had it not been for the Lord and his dying on the cross for my sins, I would be jacked up if it had not been for Jesus. I dare you to look at somebody and say, Jesus, Jesus. Yes, he is. Anytime you get in trouble, can I help you? Yeah, just call his name when you get in trouble. As a matter of fact, if you're in trouble right now, just call his name. I double, 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 double dog dare somebody in here to call his name. His name is Jesus. Look at somebody and say, Jesus. Uh, and if you want to get fancy with it, just say J-E-S-U-S. -S. Uh, J-E-S-U-S. -S. Uh, what does it spell? It spells Jesus. He, he's a way maker. He's a healer. He's a provider. He'll stick with me through thick and thin. That's why I call on his name like I do every minute I get. I call on the name of Jesus. <laughs> salvation, salvation. Secondly, secondly, Paul utilized the metaphor of the human body to explain the Christian way of life. Christian way of life. Yeah, Christian way of life. Because of a Greek philosophy influence, Greek thought was that there are essentially two bodies in the same being, physical and spiritual. Now, the idea of a spiritual body wasn't associated with or didn't begin with Christianity. But when Christianity came into being, the idea of the spirit and physical was easily embraced and understood as the body and the soul. The thing is, Greek philosophy understood that everything related to the physical body was bad and everything that was related to the spiritual body was good. The result was sin was often understood from two different uh, positions. Number one, it was understood that you have no control over your physical body and you could, you could not help it when you did something wrong. So there was no point in trying to do right. Secondly, it was to embrace wrongdoing because it had no effect whatsoever on your spiritual body. You could sin all you want if you understand your spirit to be saved. Yeah, that's what they said. But then thirdly, Paul saw uh, the human body as well as our soul as creation of God. The spirit wasn't just a traveler camping out for a hundred years or so. Our bodies are not bad and they are not separate from our mind and heart or will. Paul uses the metaphor of the human body to call us to live spirit-filled lives. Can I say that again? A spirit-filled, Holy Ghost filled life in a very human world. That's just a better way of saying it. you've got hell all around you. Every time you turn on the television, there's drama on the news. Every time you go on your job, there's drama at work. Every time you look around, there's mess around you. But I came by here to tell you that if you are spirit-filled, Ah, spirit filled uh, you can overcome the challenges that you face in this everyday life the body is controlled can I help you the body is controlled by the mind and the mind is controlled by the will finally Paul also utilized the metaphor of the human body because of a worldview that understood two frames that existed uh, one time frame was the here and now. Look at somebody say right here and now. Here and now. Here and now consists of evil. It consists of wrongdoing. It consists of disease and innocent people being ill and injured. Here and now is a time of oppression and the need of a deliverer and a savior. Look at somebody say, I got a savior for you. Huh? 
<laughs> but someday there would be the second age, the new age, and in that day the Redeemer would come. The Redeemer, he coming and would go about making people whole, setting things right, freeing people from their oppression. Paul saw that age, the new age, as beginning with Jesus' resurrection. The new age starts when Jesus got up from the grave. <laughs> the time of redemption has come and is now coming about in Paul's lifetime. Paul saw us in our human bodies living in the new age, the age to come and the end times. Paul also utilized, here it is, can I just work with this, the metaphor of the human body to talk about sacrifice and being made right with God and to invite us to take it personal. Take it personal. Take it personal. Let me let that set in. You've got to take it personal. Personal. You've got to take it personal. The bodies of the animal sacrifices, watch this, watch it, watch it. They were laid on the altar to make up for our sins. Can I, can I help somebody? Can I take you back? Uh, that they were laid on the altar and they were sacrificed for sacrifice for our sins to express our joy and thanksgiving to ask and invite God's presence into our lives. That's the only reason why we put animals on the altar. But dig this. Paul invites us to lay our human life upon the altar to take the sacrifice of our life for Christ very personal. In other words, can I help you stop putting other stuff on the altar? You ought to put your own life on the altar because the truth of the matter is some of us need to be sacrificed on the altar of God. And so here in the 12th chapter of Paul's letter to the Romans that speak about laying physical bodies before God as an act of spiritual worship, uh, of not conforming to earthly, physical thought, but allowing our minds and hearts to be transformed to a spiritual lifestyle. Living in the time in this world as one who is of another world, another time. Yeah, we are called, watch this, to be living sacrifices and to take it personal. How do we take it personal? Well, I'm glad you asked me that question. Well, you know, if we do all that Paul invites us to do here, we are actually being called, watch this, to a sacramental lifestyle. Somebody ought to write it down. A sacramental Sacramental lifestyle. Can I help you? You missed your opportunity to shout. Well, I'm going to give you some more time to let it soak in because we're going to shout in just a few moments. I'm a, I am a sacramental lifestyle. Now, now, what exactly is a sacramental lifestyle? Well, what is a sacrament? I'm glad you asked me that question, too. Can we go back to new members class? Can I take you back on a journey and then bring you forward just for a few minutes? Well, a sacrament, here it is, is an outward sign of an inward grace. I got to say that again because you missed it. It is an outward sign of an inward grace grace. Nah, you didn't get it. Let me say it one more time. A sacrament is an outward sign of an inward grace. Yeah. It is something that symbolizes, here it comes, the grace it represents and it is a conveyor or a carrier of grace as well. <sighs> Every first Sunday, is it first Sunday right now? Is it first Sunday? Ask your neighbor if you're not sure. Is it first Sunday? Is it, is it first Sunday? Are we getting ready to take communion? It's first Sunday. I'm just trying. I, I, I'm not sure. I thought I would ask you. Is it first Sunday? All right. So each first Sunday, here we go. We partake of the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. Can I get it out? Yeah. The bread and the juice 
are an outward sign of the grace we know we receive in Jesus who ate a meal with bread the night he gave himself up for us. And he ate the meal in a way that he instructed us to remember what he did for us in dying on the cross every time we eat the meal. Every time you eat it. Every time you come to church on a first Sunday, every time you see the altar draped in white, every time you see the preachers dressed in white, every time you see the deaconess dressed in white, you know it's first Sunday and we get ready to take communion because we want to remember what God did for us through Jesus. Huh. That's, that's some shouting stuff right there. When you remember what he did for us, that's enough to make me shout all day long. As a matter of fact, preacher, you don't have to preach anything else. All you have to do is tell me that he died for me. And every, every first Sunday, I come here to take the communion to remember the sacrifice that he made for all of us. For everybody, look at somebody say, you too. <laughs> the Lord's Supper, the Lord's Supper, the Lord's Supper, here it is. I'm going to slow it down. The Lord's Supper is an outward sign of an inward grace living in us. I just took you back to new members class. Matter of fact, I just gave you some Methodist theology. Can I give it to you one more time? Look at somebody say, give it to me, pastor. <laughs> oh, only because you asked. Here it comes. The Lord's Supper is an outward sign of an inward grace that's living inside of us. And there is a way in which we receive that grace. Listen, all over again, every time we come here and take the Lord's Supper, again and again, and again and again, and again and again, we don't stop taking it. We keep taking it to remind us of what Jesus did. We don't stop. We do it all the time. We, we just keep on doing it. We just do it because it's a reminder of the ultimate sacrifice that he made for us. So, what then, Simon Temple, does it mean to live a sacramental style life or a lifestyle, a sacramental lifestyle? Well, I'm glad you asked the question. You've been asking a lot of questions today. Here it is. What does it mean to live a grace-filled life, an outward life of grace within, an outward, an outward, here it is. What does it mean to live a grace-filled life, an outward life of grace within? What does it mean to live a life that represents the grace within us and to be, here it is, to be a carrier of that grace as well? You are a carrier of that grace. Y'all missed it. <laughs> you take it as a means of grace. But then when you take it, you carry it with you wherever you go. I don't take communion just for the sake of taking it. I don't take it just because it's there for me. I've got to get my mind right and my spirit ready to take the communion because I've got to be serious about what God has done for me. Not just that, but i got to take it with me when I walk out the door. Huh. Oh, I wish I had somebody right now who would just shout on that one all by itself. When I walk out the door and people see me, they go see communion all over me. Uh, because what I take inwardly becomes my lifestyle on the outside of me. Uh, uh, can I keep on going? I just got a few more minutes uh, and then we can shout all the way home. Here it is. So what does it mean? What does it mean? It be, what does it mean to be a carrier? Paul had some ideas about that. Each of us, we contain abilities and gifts. Can I say that again? Everybody. 
Everybody has abilities and gifts. Uh, look at your neighbor and say, he talking to you. We all got them. We, we all have them. We all have them. We, we all have them. We all have them. We all have them. Uh, some of us, you know, we can, we can teach, you know. Some of us, you know, we're whiz at numbers and financial skills. Some of us, you know, we're encouragers. You know, you know how to encourage people. You know, you've been blessed to be an encourager. You know, you just walk up to people, and when you say something, people, they're just encouraged by your presence. There are gifts and abilities that each of us have. And so, Paul says, whatever those gifts, whatever those abilities are, whatever we possess, they should be used as a sacrifice and sacrament to God. We should use them to the best of our ability and do them in a way that is pleasing to and benefit God. Ah, Y'all missed it. I don't operate in my gifts so that people can see me. I don't operate in my gift so that people can say nice things about me. I don't offer, operate in my gift because I want people to pat me on my back. Oh, I, don't, I, don't, I don't stand on the door as an usher so you can say, oh, I'm a good usher. I don't sing in the choir so you can tell me I got the nice connect with my solo. I don't play an instrument in the church so you can tell me I'm all that in a bag of chips. I don't serve on the board so you can say, oh, he walked like a trustee or he walked like a steward or she looks like a class leader. No, no, I do it so that God gets the glory. That's why I do it. I do it so that my name is not called. I do it so that God's name is called. So that when they see you operating in your gift, they get excited about Jesus. Oh, my God. You ought to look at somebody they say, I know that's right. Woo! Huh. Yeah, but not only that, I'm getting ready to shut this thing down because I can feel a bubbling in my spirit. Uh, you know, I'm itching. When I start itching, that means a praise about to break out. Woo! Uh, look at your neighbor say, it's time. It's time. Well, we, are, <clears throat> we, are, we are called, yeah. We are called to examine ourselves. Okay, let me say that again. You missed it. We are called to examine ourselves. We, we are called to examine ourselves. Yeah, what? Examine what? Examine our personal and our moral character. Uh, oops, kind of got quiet on me on that one. We've got to look in the mirror and ask ourselves the question. Am I living the life I should be living? <laughs> Am I hanging out in places that I shouldn't be hanging out in? <laughs> Am I staying in homes and places I shouldn't be staying in? Okay, y'all still not there yet. I, I, I need a few of y'all just to say amen. Just fake it if you want to. Say, preach, pastor. Just fake it. It's okay. I got I to gotta look in the mirror. Talk, touch somebody. No, no, don't touch them. Look at them. Say, I got to look in the mirror. I got to look in the mirror. I got to examine myself. Because trust me, when we look in the mirror, there are some things we got to work on. <laughs> Can I just ask somebody a question? Is there at least one thing in your life you got to work on? I mean, just one thing. Say, Lord, just Lord, Lord, don't let me cuss them out. Come on, this is okay. Lord, don't let me, I, because I know, I, I know, Lord, you, Lord, Lord, work with my tongue. I, I need you to work with my mouth <laughs> because my mouth is too big and, and if somebody says something crazy I might just open up my mouth my big old mouth and say something crazy sometimes we got to say Lord work on my mouth sometimes you got to look down at your feet and say Lord work on my feet because sometimes my feet takes me places I shouldn't go oh y'all still didn't get that you, you didn't get it there's some places your feet will take you when your eyes take a look. So sometimes you got to cover your eyes so that your feet don't start walking in the wrong direction. Okay, I think I got the wrong crowd. Can I ask the saved people? J just give me some saved folk. Have you ever had a moment in your life where your feet took you to the wrong place because you looked in the wrong direction? 
Oh, I know. I know I got more than that. There have been some of us, we've been in some places our feet have taken us because we looked in some spots and we went there and got messed up. I'm just trying to tell you that every now and again, you got to look down at your feet and you got to say, Lord, guide my feet. You got to wake up in the morning and say, Lord, touch my mind. Lord, I need you to work on my mind because if you don't work on my mind, something going to happen. <laughs> because when I get to work, I'm going to set it off. Okay, y'all still not there yet. I mean, there's some folk that I'm telling you, you sitting right on the edge. You getting ready to jack up a boss, a coworker, or somebody. Somebody looking at you crazy, and you ready to jack them up. But I came by here to tell you, you've got to tell yourself. You've got to look in the mirror before you leave. You've got to say, Lord, I need you to work with my mind. Because, Lord, if you don't help me, I'm going to leave here and do something crazy. <laughs> And then here it is. Uh, you've got to say, I'm getting ready to shut it down. You've got to say, Lord, look at my hands. I work with my hands. Because uh, if I'm not careful, I might reach out and touch somebody I shouldn't be touching. Oh, I got the wrong crowd. I'm sorry. Uh, look at somebody. Tell them I got to watch my hands. Uh, because if I don't watch them, somebody going to get hurt. Or I'm going to walk into something I shouldn't be walking into. So, Lord, every day I got to get up and say, Lord, touch my mind, touch my hands, touch my eyes, touch my feet, touch my body, because, Lord, I need you to help me. I know I'm saved and I'm baptized and I'm, I'm a tongue-toting, Bible-killing, craw cross-wearing, vampire cross around my neck, but there are some things in my life, Lord, I need you to help me with. Can I talk to the real people as I get ready to close this sermon? I need some people who are real, genuine. You understand you've got some deficiencies. You understand you've got some issues and some struggles. You've got some problems. And you understand that every day you've got to get up and say, Lord, help me. Matter of fact, I feel it in my spirit. I got about five people now. You said, Lord, thank you for this part of the message because I was just waiting to get to the parking lot so that I could jack somebody up who was in church because of what they said. No, I was going to get them because of the way they looked at me. And now you said, nope, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to, nope, no, by God's grace. I'm going to go over to them. I'm going to hug them, and I'm going to say, thank you, Jesus. You've been a blessing. I love you, and the Lord is going to bring us together to do some great things. Uh, uh. All right, let me close with this. I got to go. Let me give you this story. You know, I love, I always love to close with a story. Uh, I'm going to close with a story. I like, I like this. I, I need, uh, uh, yeah, uh, uh, sacrifice. Uh, uh, I'm a living sacrifice. Look at your neighbor say, I'm a living sacrifice. I'm I'm a living sacrifice. I'm a living sacrifice. Well, uh, uh, you probably heard this story before, so I need you to act like you never heard it. Act like it. Just, just perpetrate. Fake the funk. Just laugh anyway. Wave your hand anyway. Here it comes. I like the story of the chicken and the pig. The chicken and the pig. Somebody said the chicken and the pig. What are you talking about? Chicken and a pig. Chicken and a pig. Both the chicken and the pig, they were, they were walking down the street. Chicken and the pig, they're walking. They're walking. I just want to set the mood for you. They're walking. Chicken and pig were walking together. Yeah. And, and one day... Uh, they, they come to a grocery store, and they're walking down the street, chicken and the pig walking. And they came uh, to a grocery store, and, and the grocery store had a sign in the window. Sign in the window. And, and the sign read just like this. It said, it, said, it said, bacon and eggs desperately needed. <laughs> chicken and the pig, they're walking. They look over. They see a sign, and the sign says, bacon and eggs 
desperately need it. Well, the chicken, you know, you know how to cheat a chicken. He just just jumped out there, and the chicken, he looked at the pig, and he says, I'll give them some of my eggs if you give them some bacon. That's what the chicken said. The chicken said. The chicken, the chicken, he just said, if you just, the chicken said, if you give them, if you, I'll give them some, I'll give them some eggs if you give them some bacon. Yeah, well, well, the pig, the pig stares back uh, at the chicken, and, and he says, no way. That's what he said. He said, no. No way, no way. And then the chicken, chicken, he was surprised. He said, why not? Why not? Why not? Well, to which the pig said, he said, because for you, it's a contribution. But for me, it's my life. Unfortunately, today we have too many Christians who are only willing to give God an egg here or there. (laughs) And and, and they wonder why God isn't showing up miraculously in their lives. And the reason he's not doing that, because God has asked us believers, watch this, to climb up on his altar. Yeah, and give him our all. He said, you got to get on the altar. You've got to give me everything. Or another thing that believers will do is climb up on the altar and then they jump back off. (laughs) When things get heavy, we get off. We get on, say, Lord, I'm with you. Lord, Lord, I got you. I'm with you, and, and I'm going to step with you, and, and I'm going to walk with you. And then we jump off when it gets tough. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and our king has asked each of us to live our lives as a living sacrifice. Uh, quite literally, here it is. A sacrifice is something dead. Oh, uh, it's something dead. I'm, I'm, I got to go. It's something dead. So the truest interpretation of this term is that we are to be a living dead thing. Somebody said, that don't make no sense. You are to be a living dead thing. Uh, a living dead thing. Look at somebody say, a living dead thing. You, you are to be a living dead thing. Uh, living dead. Uh, you are living, but you are dead. Uh, oh, uh, You are alive, but you dead. Uh, I need somebody to help me with this. You are alive, but you dead. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, you are alive, but you dead. Uh, 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 I'm dead to all of my, all of my struggles. I'm, I'm dead to all of my sins. Uh, I'm dead to all of the mess. Uh, and I'm alive uh, to a new walk and relationship with God. Uh, Here it is. Uh, And so that's why uh, I am bacon and I'm not a chicken. Uh, You ought to look at somebody and say I'm bacon. Uh, uh, Here it comes. Uh, Look at a few people around you and say I'm bacon. Uh, uh, Yeah, well let me make it. Can I make it a little bit better for you? Will you just shout it out if I tell you look at somebody say I'm a pig. Oh, you didn't like that, did you? I'm a pig. Yeah. I'm not a chicken because I understand what a chicken and a pig have to do. Because a chicken only lays eggs and passes them on and keeps on walking. Yeah, that's what he does. He doesn't stay there. He just offers them and keeps it moving. But a pig, however, he gives everything. Look at your neighbor tell him everything. He gives everything. He gives it all. I came by here to tell somebody if you expect God to do something amazing in your life, you've got to give God everything. Nope, I didn't say some stuff. I said everything. You've got to have a 
pig mentality. You've got to be willing to give God all the bacon you've got. You've got to get on the altar of God and be willing to make a sacrifice. Let me just park here for a second and say, I'm so glad that it was the Lord who made a way for me. And I came by here to ask you today on this holiday weekend, I got some praises in here who are ready to lift up their voice and say, thank you, God. I'm still here. Well, let me step down a little closer because I don't think you get it. I don't think you feel it. You need to understand this. Had it not been for Jesus making the ultimate sacrifice, you wouldn't be where you are right now. And because of that, you ought to have enough sense to say, thank you, God. Just look at somebody and say, we ought to praise God right now. We ought to lift him up right now. We ought to say something right now. This is the moment that we praise God and lift him up for all of his blessings. Can I ask you the question? Have you been blessed? If you've been blessed, you ought to tell somebody I'm blessed. And because I'm blessed, I'm just going to keep on lifting him up. Even though I go through and I have some issues and some problems and some trials and some situations that it doesn't seem like I'm going to get out of. I still going to lift up my voice. I need somebody to look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, if I have to praise him all by myself, then that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to praise him on this holiday weekend. I'm going to lift him up and I'm going to magnify his name and I'm going to celebrate God for every good thing he has done for me. You ought to look at your neighbor and say I'm going to praise him while I still got breath in my body. I'm going to lift him up. You got breath? You ought to thank him with the breath you have because you don't know what's going to happen when you leave here. So while you still got it, you ought to lift him up and say thank you. Do I have some thank you folk? Uh, yeah. I got some thank you folk. Say thank you Lord for my food. Thank you Lord for my house. Thank you Lord for my job. Thank you Lord for my car. Thank you Lord for my mind. Thank you Lord for my health. Thank you Lord for my peace. Thank you Lord. I need some thank you Lord folk who will tell somebody thank you. Come on, everybody, stand with me. Come on, let's stand up. I feel like going a little longer, but look, let's come on, let's stand together. Stand together. Uh, 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 yeah, I'm good. Look at somebody say, I'm good right now, baby. I'm good. I'm good. Matter of fact, look at them say, I'm solid. I'm solid. God, thank you for your word, the power that's always founded it in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, thank God. Look, look, maybe somebody, maybe somebody came here today. You, you, uh, you know, you, you, you came to church, you know, holiday weekend. You, let me just, let me just drop in. Let me just drop in the church. See what's going on in there. Yeah, let me, let me, let me, let me peep it out on the down low. See what's happening in Simon Temple. You came up in the building. You walked up in here. And the Spirit of God spoke to you and told you that it's time for you to lay on the altar of sacrifice. 
He said, it's time. He said, he said, one of the reasons why life has been such a challenge for you is because you have yet to lay on the altar of sacrifice. We're looking to sacrifice everything else but ourselves. And God says that if, in fact, you want to live a life of peace and power, then here it is. The altar table is for you to lie on so that God can heal your brokenness, connect you to the Lord Jesus Christ, and you can experience the blessings and the benefit of a new life. Wow. And dig this. It's free. Salvation is a free gift of God. And guess what? I like to drop it like this. He died for you, for you, for you, for you, for me. He died for all of us. And all you have to do, watch this, is accept the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. Believe that he died for your sins. And that God raised him from the dead. And the Bible says you shall, watch this, not might, probably, maybe, no. The Bible says you shall be saved. Who wouldn't want that? The opportunity of a lifetime is standing here right before you. And all you have to do, watch this is step out into the nearest aisle. Come on up here and stand right on that yellow marker, right there on the floor, and let God do the rest. Here it is. I'm coming today, and I'm giving my life to the Lord today, and I'm not going to let nobody shut that down. It's too valuable, it's too important, and I'm too busy trying to go somewhere in my life, and I can't do it unless I connect with the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to give my life to Jesus today. If I'm talking to you and you know it, I want you to come. Just come. Just come. Just come. Don't even hold it back. Just say, look, I have an appointment with the Lord Jesus Christ today. And I'm coming to give my life to Christ today. That's the first invitation. The second invitation is this. I already know Jesus. I'm saved. I'm already saved. I'm saved. But I want to join the Simon Temple Church. I want to join a church where the people are a loving community of believers. I'm going to join a church where the word is preached and the Bible is taught. Ah, I want to get in there where I can function and operate in my gifts and abilities that God has given me. Here's your place to rest your soul and to grow in Christ Jesus. I'm already saved. But I want to join the Simon Temple Church. If that's you, I want you to come. Just come. Two invitations. I want to get saved. This is the first one. Second invitation is this. I want to join the Simon Temple AME Zion Church. If you're here today, don't wait. Don't hold back. Come on and experience your freedom. Listen. Listen. There were six people at the 8 o'clock service that came and gave their lives to the Lord at the 8 o'clock service and joined. They didn't just jump out quickly right away. It just, it took them a second. They thought about it for a minute, and then one came. And then after the first one came, then the second. Then all of a sudden, they just started coming. If you just take one step, the Lord will do the rest. Here it is. I'm offering you the opportunity of a lifetime. Come on, get it. It's free. I'm going to give my life to the Lord today. And I want to join the Simon Temple AME Zion Church. God bless you. You may be seated. Have a seat. Have a seat. I just want you to sit. I want you to sit. I want you to sit. We're getting ready to go into the communion service. I'm going to give one more final call to salvation and church membership. I want you to be comfortable. I want you to sit real comfortable. And 
I'm going to ask one more time. Here's the final call before I leave this building. Because we never know what's going to happen to us when we walk out of that door. I've known people to say, I'm not going to do it today. I want to do it, but I'm going to do it another time. And they walked out of the door and lost their lives. But here's an opportunity to make the connection now to the Lord Jesus Christ. Final invitation, if it's you, I'm not even going to ask you to come down here. I'm just going to ask you to just stand where you are and stay standing right where you are. That's all I'm going to say. You don't even have to come down to the front. Just stand where you are and let us minister from where we are that God will not only save your soul, but that God will allow you to move forward in your destiny. God, thank you for your word today. Thank you for reminding us that we are sacrifices, that, that we have a responsibility to the altar, yeah, and that we don't put anything else on the altar on our behalf, that we are the ones that come before you just as we are, broken, wounded, and weary, but there is something that you have greater for us to experience. And that is your saving grace. And so, Lord, if we're here today and we experience that wherever we are in this sanctuary, God, we pray in the name of Jesus that you will touch in your own way, provide in your own way. And then as you make this connection, allow them to come to us and make that personal connection and conversation beyond where we are right now. Whether that is to give one's life to Jesus or to connect with the Simon Temple Church family. And then God, we pray because we know that you are a prayer answering God. And here it is very quickly, God, whatever we stand in the need of, because there are so many challenges that we face, but we know that we serve a God that is bigger than any challenge that we face and can bring us through and bring us out. God, we thank you for doing it right now in the name of Jesus. For every person listening, God, we thank you for what you're going to do. In Jesus' name, amen.